Harris. You can take it off if you want. <laughs> Little request. Inside joke, don't worry. Um, so I have the esteemed honor tonight of presenting the Elliot Norton Major Award to Anne Hamburger. Um, I have the esteemed honor of spending a good portion today chatting with her and, um, you know, uh, immediately upon meeting her, you're, you're, you're presented with this warm, caring, uh, remarkable person. Uh, and she said such magic words to me, and it was, please, Chris, don't read this whole thing. Um, <laughs> but, but how can you not? I mean, the things that she has accomplished in her time. Although I did want, there's something missing here because I've been sitting backstage deciding on what I was going to say. Um, there's, a, there's a word here that keeps popping up in articles about you. The word, uh, it's two words, it's cultural entrepreneur. And I think that that's a really appropriate description of her. You know, Anne is the founder and executive producer of the On Guard, uh, On Guard Arts, founded in 1985 at the center of everything she does is bringing people together, not normally, in the conversation and providing opportunities to reach the uninitiated. And uninitiated. On Guard creates multimedia, documentary theater, site-specific theater, and immersive work. Hamburger has a 360-degree approach to producing shows where content, form, place, community, and audience are all inter interwoven into the production process. Her specialty is putting together artistic and production teams and developing shows from the ground up with some of the theater's most esteemed writers, directors, composers, and designers. Hamburger was executive vice president of Walt Disney Creative Entertainment from 2000 to 2008, the global organization which was founded with her arrival to the Disney company. She spearheaded the creative development of all the major stage shows, parades, and daytime and nighttime spectacles for all the parks worldwide. Prior to joining the Walt Disney Company, Hamburger was the artistic director of the Jola Playhouse. Called an invigorating urban presence by the New York Times, On Guard Arts is the recipient of six Obie Awards, two Drama Desk Awards, and a special Outer, Circle, um, Outer Critics Circle Award. Um, she has truly strived to use theater to spread awareness, to spread a message to people, especially those who need their message to be shown. Um, and most importantly of all, um, and there's something very personal within your bio that I didn't bring up earlier, um, I am myself a twin, and uh, she is a mother of twins, so that must mean she's got a lot of patience. <laughs> so it is my esteemed honor to present this year's Elliot Norton Award to Ann Hamburger. And then I transferred to University of Massachusetts, so I'm in the hood, right? <laughs> and I went to Yale, so Connecticut, yay, New England. Um, I came to the theater because I started off as a sculptor and a performance artist, and I thought that was much too lonely a profession because I love collaboration. So I moved over into the theater, and I came to the theater with a commitment about how geography and place and architecture and the city could all play a role in storytelling. I founded On Guard Arts as my third year thesis project at Yale, and I was told by Benjamin Mordecai, who ran the department, you know, your MFA is not going to be dependent upon you being successful, because he thought I wouldn't be. 
And I told him, I'm not going to write a paper about starting a theater. I'm going to go start one. He threw up his hands. He knew I was not controllable. And at Yale, I learned all the right ways to do things. I learned all the tried and true ways to do things from the hallowed halls of this Ivy League institution. But I also felt that you can learn all the right ways to do things, and then when that doesn't work, you do whatever it takes. As a matter of fact, for my very first production, we had to postpone our press opening because we weren't ready. And the New York Times was coming, but then they stopped coming, and I didn't know what to do. So remember phone books like white pages? I looked up Mel Gussow's uh, address in the phone book, I wrote him a letter about why I believed what I was doing was important. I went to his apartment building. I snuck in. I snuck a letter under his door. And later on, my press agent called me up and said, the strangest thing happened. And I was like, what? And he was like, well, you know how I haven't been able to get in touch with the New York Times? I was like, yeah. He was like, Mel Gusso called me up and said he wanted to come cover. So that's what I mean. You break the rules. <laughs> I began to create theater in the streets and abandoned warehouses in historic landmarks. And I could create theater that was truly an event in people's lives, theater goers' lives, but also people who'd never been to the theater, people who saw the shows by virtue of their location in their backyard, some of whom were happy about that, some not so much. We called it site-specific theater then, when no one knew what site-specific theater was. Now there's site-specific, site-adaptive, immersive, experiential. It gets very confusing. I wanted to create a theater with a proscenium as high as the sky, and this was thrilling. We uncovered the secrets of New York City. We endured the rain and the heat and the dirt, and we learned big lessons. I did a show at the Chelsea Hotel, and the fire department came in and closed us down. <laughs> and we needed to move our show to a warehouse down the street, which we did. And so every night when the audience came to the Chelsea Hotel, I told them the story of the fire department and walked them all down 8th Avenue like a school group. And they saw our show in this warehouse, and you know, almost no one asked for their money back. But then it became about grappling with the reality of dealing with the fire department, the police department, the buildings department, and to jump ahead, this was great experience for Disney. Everyone has always said to me, what you're doing is impossible. Well, I love proving people wrong. I love doing the impossible, and I never give up. I refuse to take no for an answer. I love to convince others that to think of theater as embracing the world in ways they never dreamed possible. I worked with many talented artists in this pursuit, artists like Chuck Nee and Ann Bogart and Tina Landau and Fiona Shaw and John Kelly and Mac Wellman and Tyne Daly and more. It was up to me as a creative producer to make it possible for these artists to collaborate in breaking new ground, artistically, metaphysically, spiritually, literally. I even closed off four square blocks in the meatpacking district with the auteur writer-director Reza Abdo. We did performances in 16 different locations. His work just received a, res a retrospective by PS1. We used a twisted metal pier in the Hudson Yards that was owned by Donald Trump. And we thought of giving him the character of Apollo, and this was bad back then. <laughs> we closed off Wall Street. We used the abandoned Towers nursing home for an extraordinary show by Ann Bogart. And Ann Bogart said to me, I want to make the building cry. So we had a production manager run down the street, turn on a fire hydrant, a hose that went up to the top of the roof, and then the, there was a pipe in it with holes in the pipe, and we made the building cry while a blind choir sang. Getting rave reviews made me ecstatic, but getting shitty reviews made me really depressed. I made shows that I thought were some of the best shows in the world, but I've also made shows that I would rather forget. I have failed. I have recovered from failure. I have failed again. And I have learned from failure. And one of the most important aspects of being an artist, as you all know, is continuing. And I've always been looking for financial support 
finding it anywhere I could, meeting with funders, hosting benefits, looking everywhere, dealing with debt, dealing with unpaid bills, getting out of debt. As you know, these are all things that are necessary for making life in the theater. And in the midst of all this art making, I got married. I had babies, I had twins. And I said, okay, now I have to achieve a work-life balance. I failed to achieve a work-life balance. <laughs> what is a work-life balance? Despite the impossibility of it all, I love having a family, an incredibly giving husband who supports my career and a career. I feel very lucky in that regard. I survived having twins. They're 21 and they're juniors in college. I became known as the site-specific producer. You know, it's a blessing and a curse to become known for something because when you become known for something, you are in a box. And then you kind of want to get out of the box. And so I became curious, like, what else is out there? I wanted to do more than one thing. So I was offered the job of becoming the artistic director of the La Jolla Playhouse, and I asked my husband if he minded picking up our entire family and moving to La Jolla, and he was like, okay, let's go. I folded on guard arts, I left New York. I was hoping for new challenges, but I was there for only a very short time because I got a phone call one day when I was sitting at my desk from a headhunter who said, we're looking for someone to come into the Walt Disney Company and found and run a global division, and we got your name from Todd Haynes, who runs the Roundabout Theater. At first, I thought it was a joke, but it wasn't, and I became a corporate executive. I, with no corporate experience, started running a global division. It was bizarre and impossible, but there I was. I had the keys to the kingdom. I was creating a new global division, and I called it Creative Entertainment. And it was for theme parks and resorts. Now, I have to tell you, I hate theme parks. But who could turn down such an opportunity? I was starting an entrepreneurial division with the resources of a billion dollar company. And so again, I said to my husband, do you mind going from La Jolla to Los Angeles? And he said, sure, let's go, go. I got there and I was told by a senior executive that I had to create an organizational chart where I decided who I was gonna hire and fire within the first 90 days or they wouldn't let me do what I wanted to do. But I wasn't going to do that because I recognized that I, people's lives were at stake. And there's a lot of people in the corporate world who need to recognize that people's lives are at stake. I won't go down that. <laughs> anyway, um, I bucked conventional wisdom and instead I flew around the world talking about my vision and my mission. I ran it like a theater company and no one at Disney knew. It was a great <laughs> trick to play. I brought in Diane Paulus to do a cruise ship show, Francesca, Francesca Zambello to create a $10 million production of Aladdin with all actors of color. I introduced Bobby and Kristen Anderson Lopez to the company. They created Finding Nemo as a musical. They're now famous for Frozen. Eventually, I found I was hitting my head on the glass ceiling, and believe it or not, I was bored. I got really sick of the politics. I got really sick of the way people treated each other poorly. There is such an amazing amount of politics at the Walt Disney Company. I was proud of what I created, but I miss New York. I miss theater. I felt like this was where my soul was. So, we decided to come back to New York City. But in leaving Disney and returning to New York after having been gone for such an amazing amount of time, I found myself in a terrible existential crisis. And then I had to ask myself, in the midst of this transition, where do I belong? How can I make a difference? And what's needed now? And against all reason and sanity, I decided to relaunch my not-for-profit theater. Now, it's crazy enough to start a not-for-profit theater once. It's really insane to start it twice. But I decided to do that, and I said to myself, okay, I don't wanna go back to what I did before I was at Disney. I wanna think about what's needed now. Who am I, what kind of experience have I had, and what do I wanna do? 
and now we were living in a post 9-11 world. And I said, I want to take everything I've learned up till this point in my life, but I want to do theater that helps to save lives. The world is so troubled now. So I started creating multimedia documentary theater productions in New York, and they've been touring the country. And the first show I did was a show called Bass Track Live about the impact of war on veterans and their families, taken from the real life stories of Marines in Afghanistan. It's been to 40 cities. It was at BAM on the Harvey stage. And it most recently went to Fort Hood in Killeen, Texas. We were invited there by the commanding general because the army can't figure out how to stop its young soldiers from committing suicide. And so they invited us in as a groundbreaking endeavor to see if theater could reach them where their PowerPoints hadn't. And I was so pleased because we performed the show for over 2,500 soldiers, most of whom had never, ever, ever been to the theater. And the Army did a study after we left and found that there was a 36% reduction in stigma towards mental health services because of our show. And so now, yeah. And so now we're gonna, we've been invited to five more bases, which I'm really, really excited about. Of course the Army isn't paying for it. They have no money for the arts. But again, I'm not going down that road. But I'm very excited that within the next year we're gonna be going to five more Army bases and I hope to bookend it with a uh, set down in New York and a set down in California. Now, while I was on the bass track tour, I had a crisis in my own family. My son fell off the rails. We had tried everything to deal with his depression, his anxiety, his learning issues, and nothing was working. I was terrified that he might even take his own life, and we decided that we needed to send him to a wilderness therapy program, which we did. You can tell I've lived a lot. This was the most profound experience of my life to look in the mirror and recognize that as a parent, my son needed more help than I could provide. So we sent him to a wilderness therapy program, and I called the head of the wilderness therapy program, and I said, I want to hear the stories of other families. So I spent a year and a half interviewing parents and kids, and we put together a show called Wilderness based on the real life story of these parents and kids. We didn't make the parents the bad people. We didn't make the kids the bad people. We didn't make wilderness the, the be all and end all and cure all because there is no be all and end all for the ills that plague us. The be all, the end all for the ills that plague us is community, sparking conversation, being together, engendering empathy. And we can use theater to do so. Now, I'm delving into the issues of undocumented Im immigrants. We're planning a five borough tour in New York, and I'm doing another piece about Middle Eastern immigrants, and I'm absolutely committed to producing shows that can help to heal the world, and I'm turning over every rock that I can find to get funding, and I get rejection letters, and I get acceptance letters, but it always I keep in mind the artistic values that are most important, quality, innovation, nuance, reinvention, trying to help heal the world, finding the money to do so, bringing people together who aren't normally together, making sure the work has an impact far beyond a four week run and changing the world one person at a time. I try to look back to learn from my mistakes. I look forward with anticipation. I teach a younger generation of artists and I learn a lot from a younger generation of artists. And I insist upon the personal values that keep me sane. Because after all, I have to remind people, especially when we're in tech, we're not curing cancer. <laughs> I remember to say thank you, understanding that none of what I do is possible without the larger community of people that help, board members, funders, friends, mentors, my family, and make sure that I make time to help people who would reach out to me for guidance. And I'm dreaming that the best is yet to come. Someone told me that they felt like the theme of my life was get in the car and let's go. And that sounds about right to me. Thank you. Thank you.